Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled We are reading today from the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, sometimes called the Revelation of St. John the Divine, but I like the initial reference to it being the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything about the future is wrapped up in Jesus. And when you understand that, despite all of the scrolls that are being opened and judgments that are being rendered through all of the terrifying things that are coming upon this world in what is called the Great Tribulation. Most of these things are tied into the Old Covenant and now again refreshed here with John in the book of Revelation. But remember, it's all really about Jesus. And if you have a revelation of who Jesus is, then all else is at peace in your life. I'm going to speak to you some principles that I feel today will be life-changing and transformational. The book of Revelation, we're going to look at chapter number four. <clears throat> After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was it as it were of a trumpet talking with me saying, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, everyone say immediately, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Everyone say one. And the Bible says, verse four and round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceedings proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And verse number 10 says, And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy everyone say thou art worthy thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory everyone say glory say honor say power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created in chapter 5, it says in verse number 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in earth, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, have prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, a lamb as it had been slain. And verse number 8 says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, every one of them having harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. Everyone say a new song. And what is the new song? Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God 
by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and i beheld and i heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing i'm going to speak to you today on this subject the worthiness factor the worthiness factor. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word right now. We pray that the living word will preach the written word. I ask you, God, to cause our minds to be clear. Let all distractions be taken away. Let every preconceived ideas that would limit our concept of you and what you desire to do in our lives, let them be taken away. All of our own history, our own knowledge of our weaknesses, God, let it be minimized and let it be exposed expunged all of our sins expunged from the records today let our accuser be cast down and let your people be lifted up let there be demonstration of your spirit with power that your perfect will may be done everyone say in jesus name turn around to two or three people before you're seated and say worthy is the lamb I am thankful that the Bible is not just a book of precepts and laws, principles and insights, but I am thankful that this book is a book full of human beings that learned how to walk with God and in the process of having a relationship with him they were found to come into a position to receive those insights, to receive that understanding, and to have that revelation. The composite of all of those treasures are what we now have in 66 books of the Bible, more than 30,000 verses written by by 40 authors over 1,500 years of time, an old covenant and a new covenant put together, but it all adds up to the same thing, that you and I have an opportunity to have a relationship with God. And so when there are details of human beings that are mixed into the text, we get a storyline. And from that storyline, it, it makes it able for us to follow along. We can see the, 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 the timidity of, of, of a man with a speech impediment that God is saying, I want you to be a mighty deliverer, but, but, but I, 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 I can't talk very good. Don't send me, send me, send somebody else. No, Moses, I'm sending you. But, but God, I, I, how, how am I going to go out there and, and, and do anything? And yet you see what Moses gave the world and you say, wow, what a marvel. And then we see our limitations. Well, I, I don't know if I can talk or I can speak, but yet if Moses could, then somehow I can. You see people that, that waver, they're up and they're down and they're in and they're out. And how could God ever use me because I struggle this way? Well, I mean, Peter was denying Jesus, telling people he wasn't even a disciple. And six weeks later, he was the preacher on the day of Pentecost any cost. I think grace can give us the stability that we need and help us through the ups and downs of our life. And you look through the times when you see David looks like he's depressed and the next minute he's writing a song about, about getting excited about going into the house of the Lord. You see all of these people through their failures and their weaknesses and it opens up the realm of the spirit to us. But I think of all the characters in the Bible that, that amaze me, of all the people that have seen great things, John is one of the most unique. He knew Jesus in a way that others did not know him. Even those that were his contemporaries did not know Jesus the way John knew him. 
all of them were trying to talk about how well they loved Jesus. They were trying to jockey for position, get closer to him and prove to him that they were better. They were more committed. They, they were a little bit smarter than maybe the one uh, to their right or to their left. But John, John didn't say, I love him the best. You know what he said? He loves me. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. And he understood that it wasn't a competition. He understood it was not about being better than somebody else. It was not about how worthy he was. He understood that there was something in the heart of Jesus that wanted to express the love that he had. And he was looking for people that would be willing to receive that love and come into that relationship. And so John would write, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He said, if if you want to understand love in all of your human experience so often it's how well we love or how well we don't love or how someone has treated us or how well we have been loved or not been loved in our life that makes us who we are but John said don't put love in a human category it's not how we love him he said if you want to know what love is it's how he loves us and that changes everything. So no wonder the one that leaned upon his bosom at supper. No wonder he got the secret. Jesus is sitting at the table at the last supper and he says, one of you will betray me. Can you see him? I mean, these are the ones that have stuck by him. When all the multitudes left that just came for the multitude, uh, for, for the loaves and the fishes, when they left, when those that just followed him for the miracles, when they were gone, it was the 12. When the 70 weren't there, it was the 12. And Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And suddenly they start saying, is it my performance? Is there something flawed in me? Am I capable of this? They start going around the table. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? The feeling of insecurity that suddenly comes into the room. Who has the, capa the, the capacity to fail him, to deny him, to, to betray him? And when we see this picture, we say, well, then where do any of us stand in this kind of a room? Where would any of us be at this table? How would we feel if Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me? Well... You know everything. You, you know my heart. You know what's in my heart. You know what I'm capable of. And I mean, they're maybe looking around, not, not looking at each other. They're maybe suddenly enamored with the cup that's in front of them or a piece of bread. Or maybe they're looking up at the ceiling or looking out the windows. And then they look back at Jesus to see where his eyes are turning to the right or to the left. And there's John just leaning on his bosom. Peter scribbles a note real quick and passes it to John. And John looks down and, who is it? Ask him who it is. Everybody know it wasn't John. John was the only one that said, who is it, Lord? Because he knew it wasn't him. Everybody else says, is it I? John had passed the test. He was beyond the performance stage. He was beyond looking at himself and saying that my relationship is sustained strictly on my own performance. But he understood that if I am going to stay in close fellowship with him, it's not going to be because of how well I embrace him. It's going to be by how well he embraces me. And can I tell you something? When we are faced with our own weaknesses and our own frailties, so often we say, God, how can I stay with it? How can I stay strong? How can I be consistent when all of the pressure is on us and there's so many variables in our lives? We don't know what might manifest in our own selves. Even, even that night, Peter said, I'll never deny you. And yet Jesus turned and looked at Peter before the cock crows twice. You're going to deny me three times. He knew what was in him more than Peter even knew what was in him. But Jesus always gives us hope. He looked at Peter and said, but I have prayed for you. And not if you're converted. He says, but when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. I know you're going to come out of this okay. 
And so God's love for us and God's grace for us is always greater than whatever it is that we're dealing with, than whatever it is that's in our lives, than whatever weaknesses or sins or temptations that we might be feeling. And so we've got to get past trying to be worthy, trying to be good enough, trying to earn it, trying to work for it, and let the love of God just hold you and embrace you. And if you ever hear the heartbeat of Jesus, it will be impossible for you to walk away. Who is it, Lord? Revelation comes out of that relationship. Revelation comes out of that understanding of the perfect love of God. John would later write, perfect love casts out fear. What is that fear? It's the fear of being rejected by a holy God. But perfect love casts out fear. John was the only one that survived. All the other apostles were were martyred. And there is lots of Christian antiquities that try to speak to us of how they died, where they died, when they died. We don't know all the details, but we can assume fairly well that John had lived at least two decades beyond the original apostles. He was probably in his 90s when he was at Patmos. And, and the, the, the reigning emperor at that time was referring to himself in Latin as Lord and God. He wanted everyone to refer to him as such. And yet John was preaching that Jesus was God, that Jesus was both Lord and Christ. He was declaring that he was King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the emperor didn't like it, so he said, I'm going to kill him. And Christian antiquities will tell you that they threw him in boiling oil trying to kill him. This would take care of him, but he just wouldn't die. And so they fished him out of the boiling oil, and they sent him to an island called Patmos. Patmos had been turned into a a quarry mine where all they would do is just dig stones out of the quarry and take them down to to the harbor where the ships would come and take take that was been mined and carried away. It was a it was drudgery every single day. Can you imagine a 90-year-old man trying to carry rocks or roll a wheelbarrow with rocks in it and he separated. He said, "I'm going to keep you so far away from your people that you won't be able to access that fellowship. You won't be able to to be connected. You won't be able to do any damage to me while you're there at Patmos. And so with Patmos, we see a, a line, an island of separation, a place of being excluded from fellowship. And yet the Bible says that, that John was, was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You might be able to separate me from my family, separate me from my friends, separate me from the church body, but you can't separate me from God. And what he says is, I can get in the spirit right here on this island, which is called Patmos. And I'm going to tell you something, no matter how isolated you might feel today, no matter how much of an island you might feel that you've been put on, or how much suffering and persecution that you might have endured in your life, can I tell you, John gives us a tremendous hope that there is no place that you can get to in this world. There's no position that you might be in in this life where you cannot access God. God, if you need him, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He said, I am your companion in tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. I was on an island called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice. And the voice said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest right in a book. He ends again speaking, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the key of hell and of death. The Bible says when he saw him this time, he fell down before him. He fell down flat before him. He had leaned upon his bosom. He had seen him in the flesh. And yet now he is seeing him in his full orb deity. Head and hairs white like wool. Gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. This is a totally different picture of Jesus than what he had seen just before he suffered. Now he is seeing him as king of kings and lord of lords. He is seeing him in his full his full glory and power. And when he sees him now, I've already seen you before. 
before, but I've never seen you like this. And he falls down flat before him. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Even if you've experienced his love, even if you've had an experience with God, there are dimensions of revelation that you and I still are waiting to experience. There is still a place that you can get to in God that will go beyond what you have ever seen before. There's a place of seeing him and knowing him. Is there anybody here today that has a passion and a desire to see Jesus in a way that you've never seen him before? I want to see him in such a way that I'd fall down before him. I want to see him in such a way that I would be overwhelmed by his awesomeness and his glory. I am he that liveth and was dead and I'm alive forevermore. What a message. What a powerful voice. And then he begins to speak to him about the seven churches in Asia and how they need to be in alignment with this revelation. Each of the churches, he reveals himself just a little bit differently because what is missing in the church is reflected by what's missing in their revelation. What is missing in us is missing because we lack revelation in one area or another. This has got to be a passion that we don't just look upon Jesus once, that we don't just see him casually or or just... Uh, occasionally, but this needs to be a passion in our hearts, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Touch somebody and say, gaze upon Jesus. Say, glance at all others. Just glance at all others. Stop for a minute, lift your hands to the Lord and give him praise. Would you do it? Many theologians will, will, will teach to you that Revelation 4 is talking about the rapture. And it very well may be symbolically speaking about the rapture. But let me clarify. John heard a voice and he presently at that time was caught away and went up into the heavenly realm. There may, this may be a reflection of a rapture that's going to happen for the whole church and that he did something that was uh, in symbolism of that. But I'm going to tell you something. He did get caught up right then. It was in our dispensation. I want you to understand this very, care- very, very clearly. It was in our dispensation, the dispensation of grace. This is after the resurrection. This is after the Holy Spirit's been poured out. It is in the same time frame that you and I are living in the church age. What I'm saying is, if John could hear a voice and be caught up, you and I could hear a voice and be caught up. If John could see Jesus that way, you and I can see Jesus that way. So many times we look in these scriptures, we look at these stories. Oh, well, John was in a special dimension. Well, John was not like us. No, no, no. He was every bit as much like you and I. He was every bit as much as like your neighbor, your friend, your brother, whoever it is that you know that's a human being that's present in this generation. You could say, you could pick any one of them and God could put the same grace upon any one of us and we could have the same experience. We are in the same dispensation of time. In the old covenant, they were jumping time frames prophetically. They were jumping. If you go to John eight fifty six, Jesus said, Abraham, Abraham wanted to see my day. He saw it and he rejoiced. Abraham saw the day of Jesus Christ. He jumped dispensations. He literally jumped over the law and he went straight to Calvary and saw Calvary. Because that was the next greatest event on God's calendar. God being manifest in flesh. But once you have been a disciple, once you've had God manifest in the flesh, walking with you, speaking to you, if you were there at the day of Pentecost, if you were looking to that that, that, that place in the spirit where all of the prophets and the kings before them were wanting to look, except for you, it was real time, a part of your life. Where do you jump from there? This is what happened with John. John jumped into the eternal. 
He jumped into eternity future. He, he transcended where we are now and saw where ultimately the end of this age is going to take us. And you know what he saw? He saw four and twenty elders sitting around the throne with golden crowns on their heads. He saw the four beasts that were around the throne and he heard them saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, and which is to come. He saw the same thing that Isaiah saw. Isaiah saw the same thing around that throne. I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train. It filled the temple. And what did they say? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Everyone say that. Say holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The Bible says the angels, they cover their face and they don't look upon the one on the throne, but they look at each other and they say to each other, holy, holy, holy. The word holy means to be distinct or to be separate. The word holy means to be uncommon. It is the opposite of commonness. It is the same terminology that you would use for royalty. You would say someone is royal. They're not like the common folk. And so when they were looking at the king of all kings upon the throne, they were saying nobody like him. There's nobody that can be compared to him. There's nobody in his class. He's holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Everything in heaven is holy. But they didn't say the throne is holy. They didn't say the angels around them were holy. They didn't mention anything else around heaven that was holy. All they could say is the one that's on the throne. Nobody like him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy. Now these are not programmed angels that only have a limited vocabulary. They don't have, you know, six sentences programmed in, and that's all they can say. You know, it's not holy, 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 holy. It's not God on an ego trip saying, I'm just going to program some angels that just tell me I'm holy 24 hours a day. We know that angels have a will. They have a will because a third of them left. And if they were programmed, they could not have left. If they were limited in their creation, they could not have chosen. So every angel that's there on that throne wants to be there. And everything that they're saying is coming out of them. It's not something that's being projected to them out of domination. You will say, holy, 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 24 hours a day around my throne and remind me of my greatness. That's not what God is doing. God is saying, I'm going to create an intelligent being that can relate to me, that can connect with me. I'm going to put him here in my presence and I'm going to see what he said. And the angels get a glimpse and then they cover their face and they look at each other and say, holy, 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 holy. I tremble in the sight of the awesomeness. Holy, holy. And they think about him again and it hits him again. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. They look at their neighbor. They look around. They look at each other. You're special. God made you special. I understand you. You're here in heaven. Look at those wings. Look at how you fly. Look at how you speak. But he's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's not like us. He's beyond us. He's beyond the scope of anything else that I've ever seen. Nobody like him. Holy, holy, holy. The constant stream of revelation that comes to them brings them back just to one word. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory, which was, which is, which is to come. And they're speaking about God who inhabits eternity. They're speaking about eternity past, eternity present, and eternity future. And now John prophetically is caught up around that throne. And he gets to see the things which will be hereafter. And by going into eternity future, he reflects back to us that are still living in time and space that it's going to be worth it. I was on Patmos. 
I was being persecuted. I'm a companion with you with all of your troubles. But he said, I got caught up in the spirit. And when I got caught up, I stood before the throne and I saw what it was going to be like. I saw the four and 20 elders that are going to be around that throne. And he said, you know what? I got to see some things that even Isaiah didn't get to see. He said, I saw them with their golden crowns that had been put on their heads. And I saw them get out and they had something else to say. They walked up to the throne and they say, thou art worthy, O God. And they took their thrones, their crowns, and they cast them before the throne of God. And you know what he said? When we get there, we're going to have something different to say. We're going to listen as the angelic beings say, holy, holy, holy. But when I stand there, I'm going to take whatever reward that I've been given, whatever crown that he puts on my head. I'm not going to say holy. I'm going to say worthy, 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 worthy. I'm not worthy of anything. I didn't get here by myself. I didn't get here by what I could do, by my talents, by my abilities. It was the grace of God. It was the mercy of God. He said, I saw a lamb that had been slain. And worthy is the lamb. Somebody say, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. And they cast their crowns. And I looked, he said. And I saw the scrolls of judgment. And there was an angel that stood there. And said, who is worthy to open the scrolls? Who is worthy to open the book? And they looked. Watch this. Nobody in heaven. Daniel couldn't open it. Job couldn't open it. Noah couldn't open it. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob couldn't open it. They were not found worthy. What's in the scrolls? Scrolls are judgment. It's God's wrath being poured out. Who has the right to open up that scroll and look at it? Because without the grace of God, without the salvation that comes through Him, our names are in that same scroll. And we have wrath and judgment upon our heads. No one in the earth that was present in the earth, no one under the earth that had already passed away. Not in heaven, not in earth, or under the earth. No one! Not one human being. And John starts heaving. No one can open the book. No one is worthy. If that if means no one is worthy, then that means all of us are condemned. And he's sobbing uncontrollably. He feels the awareness of, the, of, of, of how sobering eternity is. And, and, a, and an elder comes and taps him on the shoulder. Don't be afraid. Don't weep anymore. One has prevailed to open the book. The lamb. The lion of the tribe of Judah. He has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. You know what this shows us? A picture of Jesus. Jesus teaching in the temple. And while he's teaching in the temple... A woman caught in the very act of adultery. And they drag her before him. And they throw her down in a heap. According to the law of Moses, she shall be stoned. But what, does it, what do you say, Jesus? And they're standing there pulling on their long beards, holding on to their phylacteries, their prayer shawls over their heads, dobbing and holding their prayer books. Oh, we are so righteous and we are so in line with Moses. We are going to bring judgment and condemn. She deserves to die. Jesus begins to write in the ground. We don't know what he wrote. It was written in sand. I believe he wrote it in Sam so, sand so it could be erased. And I believe while he was writing, he was writing their sins. 
He was writing their thoughts. He was saying what they had done that was wrong. And then he stands up and says, you who is without sin, you cast the first stone. And from the oldest of them to the youngest, they start dropping their their stones and walking away. And the woman is still heaving and sobbing. What does he say to her? Woman, where are your accusers? They're gone. Go and sin no more. Wait a minute. If the rule is he that is without sin cast the first stone, he is the only one that is without sin. He's the only one that has the right to cast a stone and enforce the law. Yet he is the one that is there administering mercy. And this is what you see at the throne of God. The only one that's able to open up the books is the one with nail prints in his hands and nail prints in his feet. And he's standing before John and saying, I can open up this book because I first have given mercy to every man. And he wrote it down. Hey, hey, you have mercy. There's a lamb. There's a lamb that's in charge of the judgments. There's a lamb that's in charge of the books. The one that could condemn you, the one that could bring judgment upon your head has nail prints on that hand. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. This is, this is territory that has never been covered before. John is seeing eternity future. Why is this so important? Because Satan built his kingdom on one question. In eternity past, before the world was, there was a, an angel. He was a cherub. He was an anointed cherub that covered. His name was Lucifer. He was perfect in all of his ways. He was covered with every precious stone, the Bible says. There were pipes and tabrets that played out of him. Per- percussion and organ instruments would play out of him music. And as he would cover the throne of God, the glory of God would touch those precious gems and refract light all through heaven. And the music and the singing would come forth out of him and the angels would celebrate and they would worship around the throne. He was that closely knit, intertwined angel that was was there around the very throne of God, covered and was around the throne of God. And he was inspiring worship. And one day he looked at the one that sat upon the throne and then he somehow got an understanding of himself and said, if I could inspire worship for him, then why couldn't I inspire worship for myself? What makes him worthy? Who decided that he was God? He just decided that he was God. But, we, but he is God because we say he's God. And because we say he's God... He is God. So I wonder what makes him worthy. Why not me? I think I'm beautiful. I'm smart. Look at me. I have all these precious stones. I can make music play out of me. Why couldn't I inspire some worship for myself? And in so doing, if I could coerce angels to worship me, then I'll be a God. Just like him. I will be like the Most High. He thought that the fact that someone worshipped you made you God. When in fact, God was worshipped because he was God. But this is what I call Luciferian thinking. This is the creation of relativity. Moral relativity. It's only true because we all agree that it's true. But there is no real true. There is no absolute truth. There is no, there's no way for sure we can know that God is really God. What, what gives him the right to be worshipped? 
Why is he worthy? Worship is tied to worthship. Worship means worthy of adulation. Worthship. You are worthy to be worshipped. And so he questions the worthiness of God. And from that question, he, he caused a third of the angels to fall. And this is the constant question that he has posed. Why not me? Why him? Why accept him as the only God? Why not allow for other gods, for other ideas, for other thoughts? And so he comes to the woman in the garden. Oh, you know what you need to do? Eat of that tree. You'll be a god. You'll be like it. Luciferian thinking. This is what he is speaking to the world right now. Oh, you don't need to worship anything. You don't need to worship anyone. You need to worship your own opinion. What you think. How you feel about it. That's what really is true. There's nothing else that's really true. It's just what's been agreed upon is true. And if you can change what everybody thinks about it, well, then that will also be true. But I'm going to tell you something. God's word is true whether we agree with it or not. God's principles are right whether you accept them or not. God is God and he will be God whether you believe that he is God or not. And I will tell you how long it took for God to make that very plain. The Bible says he fell like lightning from heaven. As long as it took for lightning to flash, that's how long it took for God to deal with Lucifer and for him to understand that when you lift yourself up to be a God alongside of the God, you find out there's only room for one God and you get cast down from heaven. That's why the Bible says to this day, thou believest in one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And so he has tried to cloud our minds, challenge the way that we think. But the Bible says that John, when he got caught up, he saw the throne and one sat upon that throne. No more confusion. It's very plain. One sitting on that throne. And now, in eternity future, the question that was asked in eternity past has now been answered. What gives you the right to be worshipped? This is the constant, the constant cry of Lucifer in the earth. You know what he says to mankind? I offer you pleasure. I offer you a world of indulgence. Eat, drink, and marry, for tomorrow you die. Do it your way. Have it your way. Go to Burger King. <laughs> Have it your way. <laughs> Chick fil A's over here going, no, 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 no. <laughs> Strike that from the tape. Okay. This is the constant cry. Who gives you the right to tell me anything? Who makes you the boss? How do you know the Bible is right? By what authority do you do these things? And then that question mark, watch out. And that question mark turns around on you. The same one that questions the worthiness of God is the same one that starts questioning the worthiness of you. Now he starts walking into your life. Anytime you want something good, what makes you think you can have anything good happen to you? I know what you did. I know where you are. I know your weaknesses. I know your failures. What gives you the right to receive a second chance? What right do you have to have a ministry? Who do you think you are that you can be anointed? What kind of dream do you have in your life? Oh, it's nothing but a fairy tale that you imagine. You see, it cuts both ways. When you start going down that road, everything's a question mark. You have nothing to rest your life on. And this is the generation that we have now that has no roots in anything, no loyalty to anything. And no wonder people in their 20s now are having a huge crisis with trust issues. There are more issues with, with the 20-somethings of this day than there has in any other uh, age group because this is the area that's suffering the most. They went to their professors in college and everything their professors told you is question everything. Believe nothing. Don't believe anything that you see, anything that you hear. Doubt it all. Don't believe your friends. Don't believe your parents. The only one they want you to listen to is them.
Luciferian thinking. Everything is relative. So there has to be a way to solve this. Jesus comes. God manifests in the earth. And the Bible says when he cast out devils, they would cry out, We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. In other words, they're saying, What are you doing here? What are you doing like that? God manifest in the flesh. You're coming to be a human being. What are you doing? I'm coming to answer the question of why I'm worthy to be worshipped. You just give them their own will. But you know what? When you're done with them, they're going to be in the same condemnation that you're in. But I didn't come to beat them down and to make them less. I came to pick them up. I came to turn them around. I came to help them. And what he did for angels in the beginning is what he did for us when he came on this earth. He gave you and I a choice. He gave us an opportunity to make a decision. And when they saw Jesus, they could do what they want to with him. But he came to be to feel what we feel, to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was tempted in all points, like as we are yet without sin. No wonder the four and twenty elders are singing a new song. This is the new song. I got the answer now. I know why he's worthy. I'm going to cast my crown. For thou was slain and hast redeemed us unto God out of every kindred and tongue and people. He's worthy. Calvary proved once and for all that he was worthy to be worshipped. The blood that was shed upon that cross proved once and for all that he was willing to do for us what no one else could do and what no demon power could ever even offer. You see, Satan is a, Satan is a merchant man. He wants to make deals with you. He said, I'll take your innocence and I'll give you perversity. I'll take your clear thinking mind and, 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 and I'll destroy it with drugs. You'll have lots of highs. You'll have lots of cool places that you fly around to. You won't actually go there. You'll just think you went there. And then you'll have flashbacks the rest of your life. But it was our deal. We made the deal. I'll give you fame and fortune. I'll, I'll let you have all of this. As long as you do my bidding, speak my message, tell people what I want you to tell them to do. Go ahead. Go ahead. Destroy your liver, destroy your lungs, destroy your brain, destroy yourself, destroy your life, destroy your marriage, destroy your kids. Do it your way. That's what Satan offers us. And every time we make a deal, every time we accept the temptation, we go just a little bit lower. Let me ask you a question. Can Lucifer be tempted with anything? No. Why? He's already as low as you can get. You can't get any more evil. You can't get any lower than Lucifer. So if you are being tempted by him, that is proof that you're already better than him. You're already higher than him. You already have a dimension of <laughs> righteousness that he'll never, ever have. So why would you want to listen to somebody that just wants to bring you down and wants to make your life less than what it is? God, on the other hand, cannot be tempted either. Why? Because he has no evil in him. There is no desire for evil that is in him. And so every time we overcome temptation, he lifts us up to be a little bit more like him. And so this is what Jesus says. I've got a deal for you too. Satan gave you chains. I'm going to give you freedom. Satan gave you, Satan gave you cancer. I'm going to give you healing. Satan gave you a broken marriage. I'm going to put it back together. Satan puts depression on you. I'm going to give you the oil of joy. Satan came to condemn you. I came to free you from all of your sins. And the Bible says he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He said, I'll take your sin. I'll take your weakness. I'll take your failure. I'll take everything that's wrong with you. I'll put it on myself. And then you know what I'll do? Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white like snow. I'll give you my righteousness. Now let's break it down. I know our, what our time is right now. Let's break it down. Here's the final application. 
If you can answer the question of his worthiness, you can also answer the question of your worthiness. Every time God wants to do something for you, what happens? Question mark. Well, why would I deserve that? Well, I don't know if I can get the Holy Ghost. I mean, I'm not worthy of the Holy Ghost. I don't know if I could be used of God. I, I'm not worthy. And then you look around at other people. Well, they've been in the church longer, and they've served more years, and they were more faithful. God couldn't do much with me. I'm not worthy. That's why the Bible says when we compare ourselves among ourselves, we are not wise. Because we are not supposed to look at someone else's place in God and use that as a reference point for what we receive from God. We're supposed to look at Jesus and see what Jesus is worthy of. And if he gives me his worthiness, then whatever he can receive, then that's what I can receive. That's what John 17 was telling us. Father, they don't know you, but I know you. And I'm asking you to let them know you like I know you. That we may be one. That they may be one, even as we are one. What he was saying is the same way that the Father loved the Son is the same way that he wanted that love to be displayed for every individual on this planet. At the same way that Jesus was accepted and received is the way you can be accepted and received and nothing will limit what you can receive from God. Would you stand with me right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what he's worthy. He's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom. Revelations 5 and 12 and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And so when I say, worthy is the Lamb, that worthiness comes upon me through faith in the finished work of Calvary. And if He is worthy, to receive power, then you and I can receive power. If He is worthy to receive riches, then God can bless us with riches. If he is worthy to receive wisdom, then God can give us wisdom. If he is worthy to receive strength and honor and glory and blessing, then we can have strength and glory and honor and blessing because we are found in him, hidden in him. And this changes the whole dynamic of our approach to Christ. What do you need from God today? What do you need from God today that these things which I have mentioned couldn't solve? Power? You need the power of God in your life? You can have it. You're struggling financially. There are riches that He has in His power that He can release to you. You need wisdom to solve a problem. He's got the wisdom. Any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He'll freely give it to you. What is it that you need today? And what's the one thing that's stopping you? The only thing that's stopping you from receiving it is your own perception of whether you deserve it or not. And if you can get the revelation of what I'm speaking to you today, this is the answer, folks. This is why John was there receiving it. Because he saw him at the, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He went there. He witnessed it. And he was also at the, at the table when Jesus said, one of you will betray me. And that's when the breakthrough happened. It's not how well we love him. It's how well he loves us. Why would he want to do anything for me? I don't know. I just know he does. Why would he want to change my life? I don't know. 
does. He wouldn't do it for angels. No, but he'll do it for you. They can't sing this song. Not without us. They didn't get a new song until the redeemed were there. And folks, we have a song today that we can sing. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. And if he's worthy, then that's the end of the devil's kingdom. That's it. And he has no power in your life. Let's pray together right now. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am speaking to the voice of the accuser to be silenced. I am speaking to that magnifying glass that he has put on ourselves. And I am praying, God, that it would now be moved up to you where we can magnify you and your greatness. And instead of seeing our failures and our weaknesses, God, we will see your strength, your forgiveness, your blood that washes our sins away. Today, let the question be solved once and for all. You're worthy and you're right. And it's my privilege to serve you. It is my honor out of my free will to fall down before you. Father, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice that you would crack through the hard shell of our intellectualism. Bring through, oh God, the emotional barriers, oh God, and cause that light of truth of your love for us to penetrate the deepest part of ourselves. Now, in Jesus' name, I set you free from every feeling of unworthiness that you may receive all that God has for you. All right. I'm ready for you to come. I want you to step out now because this is your moment. You need the baptism of the Holy Ghost? You can have it. You need healing in your body? You can have it. You need a breakthrough? You can have it. I invite you to just come and worship and say, Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. And while you're praising his worthiness, he's going to lift those heavy burdens off of you. While you're worshiping him in his greatness, he's going to take all of these accusations and they're going to fall. Come, 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 come. I need something from God. I need to go the next level. I need freedom. I need healing. But I feel so unworthy. You can have it today. God wants to dig up all of those feelings of unworthiness in you. He wants to put righteousness in your spirit. He wants you to have His worthiness. You know why Jesus went to Calvary? Two reasons. First, he was persuaded that his dying would shed blood that was powerful enough to forgive the worst person. You ready? And then he was persuaded that death wasn't powerful enough to hold him. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm going to raise it back up. You know why we got a church? And I'm persuaded I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If God is persuaded, why don't you get persuaded? Let's say it again, ready? The The three greatest words in life. Thank you. It's not God is love. It's I am persuaded God loves me. It's not God is able to heal. It's I am persuaded God will heal me. Uh, We've had such moves of the Holy Ghost here. And yet somehow God has said to my heart, tell these people the greatest thing they'll get out of this whole conference is to walk out of here with an innate persuasion. 
so, I got a word for you. Some of you got prayed for. Some of you got anointed. Some of you got spit all over. Somebody slapped you around and you didn't get your healing. The Lord told me to tell you, tell my people, sometimes my healing comes as a seed. And they want a full harvest. That's a miracle. But miracles are not always given to people. But healing comes as a seed. What does that mean? You better be persuaded the seed can be stolen. You better water it. You better protect it. You better nurture it. You better pray over it. You better bless it. You better encourage it. You better talk to it. You better be persuaded that the miracle is in the seed.